Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Jason G. Uh, I'm from uh, IDEAS International Data Engineering and Science Association. Uh, we are so glad, you know, we will have this online webinar today. It's about, you know, uh, graph knowledge. And uh, today, our speaker is Professor Mayak. Uh, Professor Mayak uh, currently he's working at uh, uh, USC University of Southern California, and uh, he's a research lead in the Center of Knowledge Graph at uh, USC Information Science Institute. And today, you know, uh, the topic is about you know graph is about knowledge graph, the who, what, where when and why and how okay so it's a it's, it's a very, very interesting topic um and uh, i will use one minute to uh make some introduction about you know ideas ideas stand for international data engineering and science association uh we are a non-profit organization uh in california um we have about you know uh 200,000 you know, uh, members across uh, United States and Canada. And we, every year we manage uh, a lot of you know, uh, AI, data science, big data conference at Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, Dallas, Boston, New York, and Seattle. Also, you know, we have online uh, webinar every week, uh, 5 p.m. California time every Saturday. And today, uh, we are so happy to have uh, Dr. Manyak to give us a presentation about, you know, knowledge graph. And uh, I will uh, share, share the screen with you about, you know, uh, ideas now. And uh, I think, you know, I am finished my introduction. Uh, let's, you know, give the screen to um, Professor uh, Maniak to uh, start his presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Jason. Uh, should I share my screen now? Uh, yes, I will stop sharing. Okay. Okay, please go ahead to uh, share your screen. All right, great. So can everyone see my screen before uh, I shift to full screen? Yeah, everything looks good. Uh, can you please, you know, make full screen? All right, great. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right. So first of all, uh, everyone, thank you for coming. I, I know that it's a very challenging time that we are all facing right now, you know, working from from home for many of us and uh, spending a lot of time in front of the screen, probably. And so I will try to keep this interesting and uh, I'll save some time for questions. So if you have questions after this, we can go through this. And I, I hope you do have lots of questions. Uh, that's what really makes it fun. Um, all right, so um, uh, Jason just introduced me, so I won't spend a lot of time uh, uh, doing that for myself. But I, I, I am very excited to talk to you today about uh, knowledge graphs. Now, some of you might have heard about this. Uh, but I think all of you have actually seen knowledge graphs, and I, I'll convince you of that in a few slides. Um, and today we are we are going to go a little bit deeper into this. You know what what are these things? You know who is dealing with them? Uh, you know where and when can we? Uh, you know did they come around? Uh, you know why use them? You know if if you are um, uh, you know in an organization and you are thinking about using them and need some reasons, I, I can I'm going to go into some of those. And also what is involved when you try to build one. So, you know, how that's where the how comes in, the technology and what you need to do to build knowledge graphs and to uh, use knowledge graph. So that's a lot to cover. So um, let me get started. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm a, a research assistant professor and research lead in um, USC in the Central Knowledge Graph. So that's my website. Over there, it, it gives a lot of details on, on things that we do um, uh, and also about my colleagues, uh, all the different projects we work on. So here's just a, a snapshot of the projects that I work on. Um, and there's a general theme, which is uh, we, I want to um, use knowledge graphs and AI more broadly. 
for solving uh, social problems. Um, so that's where projects like the Human Trafficking Project, which I've been involved in for four or five years now, where we try to build knowledge graphs to uh, find victims of human trafficking from web data. Um, but I also work with Yahoo, um, now Verizon Media, on e-commerce knowledge graphs. Uh, we are going to be hosting a workshop on that at the KDD, uh, which will happen in August. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a venue for learning more about that. Um, also, just generally, you know, social networks, uh, we do a lot of work on that. Um, common sense reasoning and question answering, that's the Mowgli project. And more recently, we also started a game playing project, uh, which is funded by DARPA. So there are lots of uh, interesting projects uh, revolving around knowledge graphs and AI. Um, and it's a very good time to be in the field right now. So uh, it's, it's actually quite exciting and uh, a lot of advances happening in this area. So if you're interested in any of these, feel free to ask me questions or go to our website. There are details on every single one of uh, these projects. Okay, so with that, let me jump into what knowledge graphs are without adieu. And before we do that, you know, I remember I said I want to convince you that you've seen this before. And um, if you've done a search in Google, you know, um, whether it's something like, you know, places to visit or, you know, movies, uh, products, etc., chances are that you have seen something like this, right? And uh, if you remember from just six or seven years ago, this is not what you would see. When you would actually search for places to visit in San Jose, you would see a list of web pages, and, and that is basically it. You would not see, uh, you know, the answer to your uh, query actually come up so directly as it does now. Uh, you would not see this thing that we call a knowledge panel on the right-hand side, you know, which uh, kind of comes from Wikipedia, but also comes from Google's internal logs. And so these things are part of what we call the Google knowledge graph. Um, and I'll come to that in just a, a slide. But, um, you know, what we mean by a knowledge graph is a structured data set of entities and relationships. So entities are, you can just think of them as things in the real world. So you have Bob Dylan, he's a person, right? You have United States, it's a country. Uh, you have states, you have cities. And so these are entities, you know, named entities, locations, places, organizations. Um, they can even be events. They can be abstract things like theorems, the Pythagoras theorem, the, you know, other theorems in mathematics. So they can be, you know, pretty much anything that you can give a name to. Now, relations are um, exactly what they sound like. So they are um, uh, relationships that exist between entities. So, for example, Bob Dylan created... Highway One, Bob Dylan was born in, in Dallas. Bob Dylan lives in the US. Um, and also relationships can exist between entities and what we call attributes. So attributes are, you know, Bob Dylan has gender male. Male is not an entity, it is what we call an attribute. So it's kind of a property of the entity. So it's a minor difference, but you know, in essence, this is a very intuitive way to represent data. You have entities, attributes, relationships, and you can represent this as a graph, which is, uh, you know, nodes, uh, vertices, which are the things, the entities, and the relationships are these directed edges with labels on them. So this is basically a knowledge graph. And there's a very rich definition. It can be, be very complicated, but intuitively, this is what it is. And uh, it doesn't get more complicated than this. I think this is kind of what it is. So um, why is this important? I think one of the um, very important reasons is that... Um, they, they kind of give you a, 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 um, a sort of a balance between two different kinds of data sets, which, are, which have uh, pros and cons. So on the left-hand side, you have the database. You know, probably many of you are familiar with SQL databases. You have tables, sometimes hundreds of tables. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, for a human being to usually understand something like this. So even over here, which is very intuitive, you have orders, products, employees. I mean, it's quite intuitive, but all these relationships are very non-intuitive. It is not completely clear looking at this, what this really means, what this is implying. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, you have natural language, right? So you have things that you read in books and Wikipedia and so on. This is very easy for human beings to understand. It is difficult for machines even today to make sense of this. So left-hand side machines have the advantage, right-hand side humans have the advantage. The knowledge graph kind of gives you a way to balance both. It's a compromise between human readability and also provides a lot of structure. 
So this is where the strengths come in. Um, and in the Google Knowledge Graph, you have, um, you know, I encourage you to watch the YouTube video. And also if you search for Google Knowledge Graph from strengths to things, uh, you will see the original blog post that was published about eight years ago by Google describing the Knowledge Graph. The, the, what they were trying to say at that point was that um, we should not just interpret strings like San Jose as just uh, characters. We should recognize that San Jose is actually a location. It's a city, and so it's a thing. And there are other things that are related to San Jose. And so if we can somehow uh, recognize that, then we can do a much better job of understanding the user, understanding the user's query, and we can produce very rich results, which is what you saw earlier in the places to visit in San Jose. And consequently, we can, we can do much better in the search engine. So this is what has happened. The search engine has become very good at understanding your query. And this is one of the technologies that has led to it. So that's the what. Now, I want to tackle the who, where, and when together because it's, it's, this is such a modern phenomenon that it's impossible to actually tease it apart. So I want to look at all three of them. And the first thing I want to begin with is when. Now, you know, as we understand them today, the knowledge graphs have really emerged with the Google knowledge graph, which happened about 10 years ago, about nine to 10 years ago. So very modern, very recent. But I do want to tell you that um, graphs are not new. You know, so in math, computer science, AI, social science, um, graphs have been around for a long time. In fact, hundreds of years ago, um, Euler, the famous mathematician Euler, first invented graph theory because he was trying to solve a problem called the Königsberg bridge problem. So Königsberg is a city, it still exists. And the problem was that if you have, a, you have the city and you have the city that is divided by this river, this blue river that you see in seven different regions. And you can see that there are bridges that go from one region to another. And the question that um, it sort of was a local legend, a sort of local puzzle for the people of Königsberg, that is it possible for me to start from one region of the city and to cross all the bridges and come back to that region without crossing any bridge more than once. So in other words, can I take a full circle through, the, through all the regions of the city while only crossing each bridge exactly once? In fact, Euler showed that you cannot do that. Um, and he used, he invented graph theory to solve that problem. So it, it sort of started what I really like about this is that it started with problem solving. You know, so Euler was not trying to invent some abstract theory just for the sake of it. And many math mathematicians actually do that. You know, just invent a theory because it's beautiful, um, you know, or it's trying to solve an abstract problem. But Euler was trying to solve a real problem. And that tradition has continued in graph theory. So in the last hundred years, you know, there was a lot of mathematics that came after that um, and, and which has been very useful to us since then. But um, you know, we saw in social science, the social network became a ubiquitous phenomena. So, you know, the LinkedIn, uh, Microsoft Graph, Microsoft uh, took over LinkedIn, obviously, um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and so on. You know, these social networks um, are now huge. But even before that, for since the 1930s and 40s, people were studying social networks and friendship networks. The neural network is itself a graph and has been studied as such. It is now, of course, extremely influential and popular. So graphs have, have gained a lot of prominence in AI and network science and has become very important. And so the knowledge graph, if you see it in that light, is not something revolutionary. It is um, yet another manifestation of graph theory um, and, and sort of an important manifestation. Okay, so with that, who is actually doing this? All the big players. So it started with Google, we saw that. But Amazon has been dealing with the product graph. And so over here, you know, we, um, we actually, um, uh, you know, we'll be covering, as I was saying earlier, e-commerce. We have a, an active project going on in e-commerce knowledge graph. Um, and the biggest player on that space is Amazon. But it's not the only one. The Japanese company Rakuten uh, also deals with it. Um, several other big e-commerce giants that I do not want to name, but I work openly with them, um, in the, at least in research, uh, also deal with it. Uh, so product graphs are very important. And in fact, one of the biggest commercial um, use cases beyond uh, search, you know, which is, which is pretty much Google. Um, but also Uber is building an enterprise knowledge graph. They have given talks on this. Um, you know, LinkedIn uh, has, you know, used to be a social network, just like Facebook and Twitter and so on. But these days, the social networks have turned their uh, social graph into these knowledge graphs. So in LinkedIn, you know, you don't just have connections anymore, right? You have 
all kinds of things like you know where you went the universities the jobs you held um the learning that you have done uh through uh certifications and so on and you know insights and all of these so these things are all very structured actually so when you start filling out your profile in linkedin or if you try to change your profile in linkedin you'll notice that there's a lot of uh, pop ups you know like when i try to type that i work for usc uh, they already have usc as an entity in their knowledge graph so when i type usc it actually pops up i can click on it and now there is a relationship between me and between usc right and so gradually they are able to fill out their knowledge graph and do a much better job with recommendations you see the recommendations in linkedin on the side right this job is right for you or take this course or make this um connection and so on so it's it's actually a uh, very rich and um this is very exciting um um you know and uh, i'm not I, I, you know shouldn't just take my word for it so obviously if the big players are involved it is uh, it has a very real application but also the consulting company gartner identifies a uh, graph analytics as a top 5 grant and actually if you if you look at the um description i provided it over here in the very last sentence what they are talking about is um knowledge graph so when they say that okay we are going to need to ask complex questions across complex data which is not possible using sql queries you can sort of think about that curve that i showed you earlier you know where the it used to be that if you want to ask queries you would have to have a database on the left hand side or if you want to generate something that a human being would read you would have to have a natural language document on the right hand side but now we we need something more than that and so that's why the knowledge graphs come in so it's here to stay and hopefully this will also be used so you will you will um uh, you know maybe try to uh, build your own or make a case for this and maybe even take a leadership position in your organization um once you learn more about this okay so with that how do you actually build and use something like this let's delve into some technical details um this is how i like to um uh, ex uh look uh, sort of convey a, a high uh, level sort of two level schematic so we always begin with the corpus which could be documents but it usually is documents like you can think of the whole wikipedia dump but it could also be logs it could be web pages tables reviews social media we work with all of these things and it could be a mixture of these it doesn't have to be a a, a homogeneous corpus um so you have a corpus you begin with that and then there are two big steps and each of these two big steps are entire pipeline with their own right i will go over them one by one but first you have to do what's called kg construction knowledge graph construction which means you have to extract certain pieces of information from the corpus then in some sense you have to clean up the knowledge graph and then you get the knowledge graph and you have to build applications around it so that's kind of the one line view but it's obviously a whole lot more than that so step 1 knowledge graph construction the very first thing we have to do is so we get these sentences we get these documents you can see that over here in 1933 while einstein was visiting the us and adolf hitler came to power um in the next one you know uh, you have uh, the this is a full uh, paragraph which has been separated into sentences and the first thing we have to do is do name identity recognition so this means we extract things like we extract the things right so the entities so it's persons country religion dates but you know it doesn't have to be just these it could be um you know uh you know uh, it could be any named entity which is of interest to you so google for example it uh, doesn't just look at person you know it it, it probably looks at a uh, different kinds of persons like politician artist and so on so you can have a very detailed ontology you can think of this as a schema or an ontology which is describing the concepts that you are interested in and then you have to extract the entities that are typed according to the concept so person is a concept einstein is an entity jewish is a concept uh, sorry jewish is an entity religion is a concept right so another um uh, entity for that would be hindu for example right and so on um and so you have concepts and you have entities so you have to extract the entities the concepts you usually define uh, based on the application so usually a human being defines it and there are many sets of concepts and ontologies openly available the wikipedia um, ontology for example describes uh, many of the concepts that you see in the world and so on okay the next step is relation extractions and all of these things can happen together by the way you know there are advanced methods where all of these things happen jointly um but conceptually even if uh, they happen jointly conceptually you can think about this as okay you have named entity recognition it's the simplest thing that you can do on this 
I'll, I'll point out a couple of packages that you can use for this also, open source packages. You have relation extraction, which is, um, you know, you have Bill Mays, who is a person, the, the bearded, boisterous pitchman, who as the undisputed king of TV, Yell and Sell became an unlikely pop culture icon, died at his home in Tampa. So you can see here, Tampa is a city, and um, there's a relationship, which is, okay, what's his place of death? So that, that is kind of the relationship over here. And you can see it's very, it's a hard problem because the relation can be um, between two entities which are very far apart in the text, right? So it's, it's um, not very easy to discover these relations. And it's, in fact, that's why you have a lot of noise when you do relation extraction, the techniques are not that accurate compared to NER. Um, but this is kind of, hopefully this gives you an intuitive feel for uh, what relation extraction is. And so think about this as, okay, in the first, the NER, you are discovering the nodes in the knowledge graph from the corpus. The relation extraction, you are building the directed uh, edges between the nodes, okay? Now, but that's not all, right? Because um, the problem here is that even when you do NER, um, you can have the same um, extraction that is referring to the same, uh, you can have different extractions referring to the same thing. So you have um, over here, the Tin Woodman went to Emerald City to see the Wizard of Oz and asked for a heart after he asked for it. So the problem here is that he and Tin Woodman are one and the same. So we don't want to extract them as different things, right? And then you have a heart and it, which are both in yellow boxes. And these are also one and the same. Now you can see why this is hard. Like if you have it, is that referring to the Wizard of Oz? Is that referring to Emerald City? Is that referring to a heart? This is actually a hard problem in natural language processing. But ideally you want to do this so that you can get as much information as you can from the text. And to give a more realistic example, you have the next one, which is I had no idea I was getting in so deep, says Mr. K, who founded Justin in 1982. And this is from a news article. So you can kind of see here that, you know, you have just two or three entities, but they occur all over the place and you want to um, resolve them before you actually extract them. So that's the core reference resolution, which means that pronouns, nouns, how do I know whether they all belong to the same cluster? They are all in, uh, referring to the same entity, right? So that's a hard problem. So this is more advanced, but you want to ideally try to do this um, before you go on to the, um, uh, the next step, uh, which we will go into in a second, which is knowledge graph completion. Now, I do want to say something, which is that I make it sound like there is only one way to do this, but in reality, there are many, many techniques. You will find hundreds of papers. Um, you will find many packages to do this. Within a package, uh, you will find um, many different modules you know, that are giving you options. So you can have glossaries. What is a glossary? It's like a list of keywords. So like for countries, you, might, you can easily get the list of all countries in the world, right? That is you know, very easy to get. There are only about 200, 250 countries. I don't know the exact number, but it's not that big. In fact, you can get the list of all cities. You can get the list of, um, you know, so on and so forth. The problem with that is that, um, and then you can do keyword matching, right? So you get a list of um, countries and you try to do keyword matching. That, okay, if I see a United States in my documents, then, you know, I've, I've recognized the country. You can have regular expressions. This is very good for extracting phone numbers, for example, or emails. You have natural language rules, um, which are more advanced, but you can train them using a neural network. Uh, semi-structured, conditional random field, and so on and so forth. Like these are all different uh, modules that you will usually find in the um, named entity recognition and uh, information extraction packages. And I've kind of provided this chart to give you a sense that there are lots of design trade-offs and decisions. You don't have to understand all of it. You might even disagree with our, um, uh, you know, what we have said in these cells. You might say, for example, well, you know, the effort for regex is not that much. I can easily write a regex. You know, so it might be different for you. For some people, it might be hours. For some kinds of fields, it might be harder than others. But the point here is that you have to make a lot of design trade-offs and decisions. So it's not an easy thing. It requires a lot of experimentation. Okay, so once you do that, you have kind of a knowledge graph at this point, but it's noisy. You will have many, um, you know, imagine that you have many documents. Einstein will show up in the same, um, in different um, documents multiple times, right? And you can have different relations, different documents, different, uh, uh, you know, ways of referring to the same entity. So, for example, um, uh, uh, you know, you have, um, you know, President Bush, 
um, George Bush, George H. W. Bush, right? So all of these are different ways of referring to one uh, thing. And co-reference resolution will only help you usually if they all show up in the same document. But we are dealing with many different documents. So we have to clean up the notes that we extract. So that is kind of the knowledge graph completion. It's much more advanced. It uses a lot of machine learning. I will very quickly tell you that there are um, one big problem is entity resolution, also called record linkage. So here you can see that, okay, we have this knowledge graph that we built from the documents, so DBpedia and Freebase. And you can see that Freebase Microsoft, DBpedia Microsoft are one and the same thing. So we should not, we don't want them as different nodes. We want to link them using a relationship called same as, so that we don't get into trouble. If I now issue a query asking, okay, how many companies are in my knowledge graph? I don't want to double count Microsoft, right? So for that reason, I want the same as Edge. So that's just one reason. But in general, if you want to answer questions accurately, you want to do the entity resolution. And this is a very hard problem as well. Um, if you want to use neural networks, you know, you can do knowledge graph embedding. This is kind of like word to word, but it's for knowledge graphs. So you are taking the nodes and relationships, you are embedding them into a vector space. You know, I'm sort of showing for um, two different algorithms, trans C and trans F. Um, but you know, in general, many, many algorithms exist. Fran C is a very good one. It's openly available, implemented in several packages. And you know, once you embed in vector space, you can do many, many uh, vector operations, just like word to word. So again, I can, I'm happy to answer questions about knowledge graph embedding later on. Uh, the point is that you can start using neural networks on these knowledge graph, clean them up even more, cluster them, uh, do things with them, etc. So just to revert back to this, you know, we start with the corpus, we do knowledge graph construction. It itself involves multiple steps, then there's knowledge graph completion, and then finally you get a knowledge graph. It's not completely clean. It may be incomplete and noisy, but the nice thing is that we have figured out a way, usually with the right application, like search, recommendation, um, and so on, you can work even with a noisy knowledge graph. You don't need a perfect knowledge graph. Um, you know, usually with the big knowledge graph, we can actually do very a good thing. Towards the end of this talk, I will actually show you how it's been used right now for COVID-19. So that's obviously a very relevant topic. Uh, many people are building knowledge graphs from COVID-19 data. And I will show you towards the end how that, what the resources are for that. So that's actually a very um, exciting thing that has been happening in the last one month. Um, but it's not, it doesn't take too much time. If you know what you're doing, there are lots and lots of packages. Um, and you can actually uh, get quite far in a very short period of time. Um, okay, so many resources available. I mean, I've kind of pointed two books over here if you want to learn more about this, especially for construction and for entity resolution. Uh, there's also a book on uh, 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 KG's a textbook, which is very comprehensive that um, will be published later this year. In fact, just this month, I will be giving the final version of this to MIT Press. We are revising it right now and it will get published in the fall. So that is something that um, we are very excited about. It's kind of a one-stop shop um, for learning about this from beginning to end. And it's, it's easy to read. It's not very technical in the sense that you do not need to be a researcher to understand this field. Uh, we are um, going to give you a book that takes you from beginning to end and also has resources, software packages, everything is included with that. So we intend it as a resource for um, graduate students and upper level undergraduate students you know so how you how you have like uh, textbooks on machine learning for example so watch out for that if you're really interested we are um, we are working very hard to get that out in a few months and here are some packages spacey is a very good package for information extraction for knowledge graph construction the other one is nlpk neo4j is very good for infrastructure so if you want to if you have a knowledge graph and you want to store it you want to query it neo4j is very good for that, it's not the only one, but it's almost dominant by this time. It, it's, it's very well known and used by a lot of people. Um, there are both community and non-community uh, or commercial licenses, I believe, available. But uh, you should go to their website to get the latest details. And also Facebook research and Google research release a lot of open source packages these days. They are not protective about the work that they do in that sense. I think it's extremely encouraging that they do release a lot of stuff. And here's just one example, which is Starspace. I will show you a little bit more on this later, but it, it allows you to do embeddings. So remember I pointed on knowledge graph embeddings. Uh, Starspace is very good for doing knowledge graph embedding. And so I'm just pointing these things out to show you that there's a lot of stuff available. Okay, so why should you do it? Um, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't like the reason that, okay, everyone seems to be doing it, big companies are doing it, so we should do it. I don't think that's a good reason. 
Um, so, you know, that is the wrong reason. So I, I don't want that to be the reason that you take away. You know, I kind of showed you why the big companies are doing it to maybe give you a sense that it is important. Otherwise, they would not just be doing it. But that's not a reason. So what is the reason? I think one reason is that, first of all, we do not have homogeneous data sets anymore. Um, you know, we have heterogeneous data sets, noisy data sets. Some of it is proprietary. So in your own company and uh, organization, you might have proprietary data, that's well and good. But there's also a lot of open source data, which everyone has. Um, again, COVID-19 is a very good case. I will show uh, in a moment, in a few slides, how much open data has been released on that. Um, but you know, there are images, there are um, you know, speech data sets, social media data sets. You can't get the full social network, but you do have APIs. For example, the Twitter developer API to get tweets. We have been collecting tweets on COVID-19 and other issues using the open API. So have many other people. Um, you have web pages that you can scrape and crawl using relatively simple tools. And then you have natural language documents, web data commons, Wikipedia, Wikidata. So there are many, many open source data sets. And these are all different. They all look different. They are heterogeneous and they are noisy. They are redundant. You simply cannot put them in a relational database anymore. So first of all, you need something that can deal with heterogeneous and noisy data sets. The knowledge graph is a very good tool for that. So that's one reason that, in fact, it's, I would argue that it's the only way to, uh, to deal with heterogeneous data sets without going into an ad hoc solution. Um, second reason, you want to have application with machine learning. Machine learning and deep learning are big things right now. We all know that. So if you want to do predictive analytics, whether it's text classification, forecasting, um, recommendation search, all of these things you can actually do very well with knowledge graphs. And I would argue that might be why LinkedIn has actually invested in it. That would be my hypothesis that the reason why they built the LinkedIn graph is because they saw that um, Google led the way with search. Amazon is building the product graph because it, it really wants to do so many different things, but especially search and recommendation. Um, so if you want to use machine learning and there's, there's ample opportunity for machine learning because once you embed the knowledge graph, or once you start dealing with graphs, um, you know, you can start doing all kinds of things as matrices, as uh, you can uh, represent the graph as a matrix, and then apply the kinds of things that we have seen with the Netflix challenge, for example, for recommendation. Um, there are many ways to do uh, uh, predictive analytics with graphs. It's very um, well covered, in, uh, you know, even before knowledge graph. So that is the second reason, and I think this is a very good reason. And then the third reason, which is an extremely practical reason, is that if you want to use open data sets and open source tools, I, I think that this is a very good direction to go in because we have a lot of open source knowledge graphs already. So GeoNames has a lot of information on cities and administrative regions, countries, but that's very good for location. There's OpenStreetMap, if you want to sort of do something with maps, you know, um, but you would not have access to Google Maps, right? Uh, completely, but OpenStreetMap is one. I haven't shown it over here. Um, Nell, which is, uh, which is never ending uh, language learning. Wikidata, which is kind of like a Google knowledge graph, but it's open source. So it's, it's like Wikipedia, uh, but it's like an open source um, knowledge graph. You know? So it's, it's part of the Wikimedia Foundation. But when you go to Wikidata, you are asked to contribute directly to the knowledge graph, not to, um, not to um, uh, you know, Wikipedia pages. So it's, it's very interesting. And there are lots of links between Wikidata and Wikipedia and Freebase. The Google knowledge graph and all these enterprise knowledge graph that you are seeing, by the way, are proprietary. So you cannot get access to them. But it, what, depending on what you want, you can almost always find a good enough open source equivalent for um, using it. WordNet is very important in natural language processing. ConceptNet is something that I'm working with a lot right now, especially for common sense reasoning, question answering, it's very important, um, and so on and so forth. You, know, um, you have many, many different open source tools and uh, research and data sets that you can use if you start um, building a knowledge graph and using a knowledge graph. So I think this is a very nice practical reason. You can also give back to the community this way. And that's a very good way to keep developers engaged and to keep developers working with uh, or the open source community. You know, so it's kind of really, it's a lot of fun also. And I, I kind of pointed out star space earlier. Um, you know, here uh, it's, there's a next paper on this from Facebook research. The package uh, is there on GitHub and it allows you to really embed lots and lots of different heterogeneous um, items all at once. I've also pointed out other things, graph convolutional networks, Kranzi and so on. There's a lot of good work on this, but if you want to just uh, start with a really good package, 
um, that has been recently released and that is quite easy to use. I would go for Startspace and also FastX. FastX is a word embedding package, but it can also be used to embed knowledge graphs. Um, and as the name suggests, it's, it's actually very fast. So you don't run into speed problems with it. Okay, so let me give you a framework um, for why you should and shouldn't do it. So why should you do it? I've given you three reasons. There are others, but these are the three big ones. Data is heterogeneous and noisy. You want to use open data sets and open source tools and research, and you, want, you have applications with machine learning. Why would you not want to do this? Well, I certainly do not want to give you the impression that it can just be done very quickly and easily. You can build a prototype very quickly and easily, but to get a production level system, it will require work. So you do need um, to have a pipeline in place, and that means that you have to give some time to it. You have to invest data sets, infrastructure in it, that being said, you do not need to have a multi-million dollar license you know, uh, to do it. I mean, unlike some of the relational databases, you can actually do everything for free in terms of software. But um, you know, ultimately, uh, you, you do have to invest manpower a little bit and time and data. So all of these things have their own currency and can't sit in isolation. It's not a good idea to build a knowledge graph and then wait for an application to come along. I think that you should have some application already in mind. And then later on, more applications might come along, but there should be some problem that you are trying to solve. And then you use the knowledge graph. So I, I am strongly in favor of a practical view, which says that, okay, I have a problem and I think I should use a knowledge graph for this problem. So maybe I want to do a better job with recommendations. Um, and I think that the knowledge graph is a perfect way to do that. So I'm going to do it for that. I'm going to have that in mind. And then later on, maybe I, there, will, uh, there will be other applications that will come along. Um, but first, I want to start by solving this problem. So it's a good idea to start from the problem. Don't just build one to sit there. I think that's a bad idea. Okay, so it, in the very last section of this talk, before we go into the questions, um, I want to say a little bit about COVID-19. Now, when I first pitched this uh, webinar, obviously this had not happened. You know, we were living in a very different time, even just a month ago, and uh, COVID-19 had not really emerged, at least in the US. And it kind of had, but... Um, you know, we were not under lockdown at that time. Um, so, uh, you know, now, of course, it's a very real thing and we cannot avoid it. It is at the center of every conversation. So what are we doing for this? Turns out a lot and not just we, but everyone. In fact, there is um, uh, most knowledge graph researchers, if not all, have, are trying to do at least something with this. I do not know anyone who is ignoring this in the research community, in the, obviously, the commercial a sector cannot ignore this either. They have a more pressing reason not to ignore it, which is not to go out of business. But um, even in the research community, we have not seen a loop. We have not just um, given this uh, to, you know, the pharmaceutical company and said, well, you know, this is a medical problem. What can we do about it in AI? In fact, we are doing quite a lot, you know, as a community. So there are ample opportunities to apply KG techniques. So I'm, in the neo 4 website, for example, they do point you to some resources. Um, they give you a website where they publish a lot of um, uh, resources. Um, in fact, there are a number of websites where resources are being published. So you have a choice of options even over there. Uh, very recently, I think just a few days ago, we, we have now NERD results available for what we call the COR Decorge 19 corpus. This is um, a corpus of about 29,000 papers on a coronavirus. So it's not, um, you know, COVID-19 is new. We don't have 9,000 people on COVID-19, but COVID-19 um, belongs to a class of viruses called the coronavirus, right? And, and there's, there has been a lot of work on the coronavirus as a whole, um, more than 29,000 papers published. And so what we are trying to do and what a lot of other people are trying to do is, is try to do NER. So you remember we saw NER earlier and in fact, in this abstract, you can see that spacey has been mentioned, right? So um, it's, it's, you know, everything that I sort of told you about is very much in views. It is not just a very, uh, you know, just things that I'm pointing out to you as toy data sets or toy packages, but they're actually being used a lot right now. So you have spacey and size spacey and other things, and they have extracted a lot of nice entities and entity, uh, more than 74 entity types. So remember we had person organization, those are all the entity types. They have used 74 entity types. Um, they use some fairly state-of-the-art machine learning to get the named entities for this. And I think that they made this available. So if you go to archive and look this paper up, you will probably see a link to uh, the NER output. So it's that, you know, just became available. 
um, another excellent meta resource. So meta resource because it's a page full of resources. It's a resource about resources. And so you have this, which is covidgraph.org, very easy to remember. Um, it has data, it has resources, it has a team that are working on this right now. So if you want to contribute to this, now is, it's a great time to actually contribute to this and to work with knowledge graphs. Um, so you do not need to actually invent a problem. If you're looking for a good problem, I would say like this is the place to go. You know, so like go for this, download the data, download some prototypes, um, you know, uh, start playing with it. It's a great way to learn about these technologies also. And along the way to learn more about COVID-19 and contribute maybe to COVID-19. Um, with that, I want to conclude. So again, I want to thank you for coming. I know it's not easy on Saturday evening and, and certainly we should not be spending too much time on our screen. So I'm very happy that you are giving this one hour to this and you know, absolutely feel free to connect with me. You know, this is a time when we should all connect. So I am on LinkedIn. Um, my website is, I also actively maintain it. Um, and you feel free to shoot me emails if, um, you know, if you want to co uh, connect and um, I'm looking forward to receiving questions at this point. So with that, I will stop sharing and uh, um, revert back to my main screen maybe. Uh, Okay, it's a uh, it's very, very interesting, you know, uh, topic. Actually, you know, uh, especially when you talk about, you know, corona, you know, uh, virus. It's a, uh, uh, you know, yesterday I talked with several, you know, engineers. You know, they, uh, we were, you know, we were trying to contribute, uh, you know, the Kaggle, you know, computation on this, yes. you know, topic. Okay. Anyway, it's it's really it's really good. Resources, we will definitely, you know, have a look at that. Okay, so um, actually, I have one question for you. So, uh, Professor, what's the difference between uh, knowledge graph and graph database? Is there any? Um, I think that they have. Uh, they, there used to be a difference in the sense that um, uh, you know the graph database was used to refer to the infrastructure like Neo4j and uh, even today Neo4j really refers to itself as a graph database, I believe. So it's kind of like um, uh, you know it used to be that it it it, it was uh, uh, graph databases were an infrastructure for um, hosting all kinds of graphs. It didn't have to be a knowledge graph. It could be a social network you know, with only one type of relation. I think that when we use the term knowledge graph, um, the practical view is that it should not just be um, for querying. It should not just be as a substitute for a relational database, but it should be used for some kind of, uh, uh, you know, way of representing natural language output. So the knowledge graph has a connection to natural language usually. Not always, but, but usually some connection to natural language or to open source data sets like Wikidata. And the relations are usually much richer. And you know, like you may have like more than 20, 30 different types of relations in the knowledge graph, you know, like located in, headquartered, employee of, and so on. And um, the graph database is one way to store and use the knowledge graph, but it's not the only one. So there are many knowledge graphs that do not use a, a graph database. And um, you know, like for example, if you're trying to do machine learning, uh, you would not want to use a graph database. You know, you would you would put the knowledge graph as a big file into um, some system. Like maybe you are using Apache Spark. You know, there's a way to use Spark with that kind of data if it's really big. But even if it's not, you can actually write programs that operate directly on the file, on the triples file, where each line is a, is an edge. You know, and so it's a triples file. It's not a graph database. Uh, but you can do embeddings and all of that actually use that format. So the graph database is just a, it's an infrastructure, I think. And the knowledge graph is, is more of a concept. Um, I think that's how I would put it. That's the main difference. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your you know, answer. So uh, let me go to the Q&A window. Uh, yeah, oh, we have, okay, we have several questions there. Yes. So, um, let me see. Okay, can you post links in the chat room? Sure, I can do that. Um, let me do that in the last five minutes. Um, but, but yeah, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so the next question is, what's the next three promising topics to be commercialized in Knowledge Graph? Oh, that's a very loaded question. Uh, um, I think, so e-commerce is a very big one. And uh, it might seem like e-commerce has been commercialized, but actually it's not. 
I would say that um, you know Amazon has its own graph, you know, but but uh, just because Amazon is doing it doesn't mean that others can't do it. So there are many e-commerce uh, platforms right now, right beyond besides Amazon, and um, you know, and so you have, for example, the Home Depot, right, which is. Um, you have Amazon, you have Walmart, you have uh, smaller businesses and so on. So I think that the um, e-commerce overall is, is a very good field to be in because um, uh, you can, you have to think about, okay, how do I actually build and supplement a knowledge graph if I'm not Amazon? So that is one, that could be one big one. I think the second one would be, um, um, you know, building knowledge graphs for marketing. I think would be a big one. I think that people in marketing uh, are not really aware of this kind of technology. You know, so like when you try to look at social media and you're trying to figure out things like, uh, um, you know, like who's talking about what, like influencers, emojis, products, um, you know, promotions, all of these things happen a lot on social media, right? And they are uh, sort of, they are not very structured. They are directly talked about in the social media text. Like I might say that, oh, you know, I love, Gillette's ad, or I love this, or this, this uh, hard drive is really fast and it's really cheap, or, you know, this suck, you know, they charge me a lot of money. And it's kind of like I'm putting a lot of stuff on social media, um, in news articles, in other places, blogs, right? And so actually building a knowledge graph that will help marketers, um, that will help um, analysts, I think is a big one that is completely unexplored in my view. I think it's there on social media platforms and uh, analytics platforms, but they don't actually use a knowledge graph to my knowledge. So there's still a lot of opportunity over there. And then I think another one would be, um, um, you know, events. So I think events is another big one. So you have events like concerts and uh, promotional campaigns. You have, uh, um, you know, things which are happening, you know, over a period of time. Right, so you have these things that happen over a period of time, and we are still. I think that the research on that is still very, uh, um, still very cutting edge, very state of the art. Like, how do we expand events? How do we represent events? Because events have a special structure. They have location. They have time. They have participants. They have like this is an event. Like right now, let's take an example. Right, this is an event right now. We have this event. It's happening between five and six o'clock in Pacific time. You know, I am a speaker in this event. There are participants in this event. It's being organized by ideas, right? So there are lots and lots of different things. Imagine if you had a knowledge graph full of events and you are trying to do something with that, right? It could be concerts. It could be that you are trying to discover something from the knowledge graph of events. Um, you're trying to recommend events, you know, to, for, for people to go to. Um, event right would be very interested in that, right? So all of that, um, biology is another important domain, you know, knowledge graphs to deal with drugs and to deal with drug discovery, all of that we are already starting to see that with COVID-19. So, you know, those are three or four opportunities, the scientific domain, marketing events. So hopefully the person who has asked about this can maybe make, uh, maybe have new technology in that or, or try to do something, maybe a startup on that. It would be great to see that. Um, okay, next question. Um, there are efforts towards moving into visual QA. What is your take on knowledge graph being able to converge and use? Okay, so I'm very happy about this question. There is a lot of cutting edge research going on in this right now. In fact, we are doing some of it. So, um, you know, in the, um, you know, uh, the, there are, the way that this, this I think works is, I mean, it's not just knowledge graph. It could be that there are right now, there are lots of tools. Um, I shouldn't say lots of tools. There's research on, um, you know, simultaneously uh, dealing with multimodal data. So if you have a set of images you, and with captions, okay, or you have images with news articles, you have images and videos that are embedded in a uh, certain context, you know, like um, in YouTube, you have the video that is embedded with the comments, right? And so on. Um, and there is a lot of work that can do machine learning on all of this combined. So if you give me a set of news articles and you give me a set of uh, videos or images, there are now techniques where I can actually take them together and I can build a knowledge graph out of it and I can embed them at the same time. And I think if I embed them at the same time, I would get much better representations for them and then I can do machine learning on them. So a lot of work is happening on embeddings, on representation learning. And I think that that is where um, the multimodal learning has, has really taken on a life of its own. Um, you know, and so one option is that, okay, if you have, if you give me an image, you know, maybe I can, what I would first try to do is that I could try to extract the objects in the image, right? So there may be, um, uh, 
you know, like uh, I recognize a famous celebrity, maybe in the image, I recognize the Eiffel Tower and these things. And then I, these are concepts now. So I can extract these objects and I can link it to a knowledge graph. And then I can try to answer the question in the context of the knowledge graph, because the knowledge graph has a lot of information, right? The wiki data has all the information I need on Eiffel Tower, on uh, a celebrity, like, uh, you know, the prime minister of, uh, or, or maybe the president of France right now, Macron, right? And so on. Or I want to know everything about Paris. I want to know everything about um, some celebrity here, like Julia Roberts or someone, you know, so I can get all that information from the knowledge graph. So it, it's, it's sort of a very interesting field. So I don't know if that, if that answers the question, but there are lots of research that is combining all the multimodal data sets, you know, embedding them together, using them for joint question answering. So very active area of research. I don't know if you have seen commercial products on this yet because it's such an active area of research. Um, okay, knowledge graph helps in making recommendation. Is it similar to segmentation or classification matrix? I think it is kind of like a matrix. So in the matrix you have, um, if you remember the Netflix challenge, it, it was a two dimensional matrix, right? You would have users on one axis and on the other axis, you would have movies, right? And then you have this matrix and we would try to use things like matrix factorization and so on to try and figure out, you know, predict what, what user will like what uh, movie, right? Um, and this is very similar, except that it's kind of like a tensor. It is not really a, a simple two dimensional, but you know, if I have a product graph, for example, okay, so if Amazon has a product graph, what they could try to do is that they have all their customers. Um, they, on one axis, they can have the products. On another axis, they can have product types. You know, so like maybe I like to order towels and um, school bags and you know those kinds of things. Um, you know, and those are product types. And we have there are specific brands that I like, right? So brands could be another axis. So I get what's called a tensor, a higher dimensional matrix, and I can do recommendations on that as well. You know, so it, it usually is a matrix or tensor representation. But in the age of neural networks, the, the difference is, is not that, um, I mean, mathematically, you don't need a matrix or tensor. You can directly operate on the knowledge graph. So there are, there are techniques to do that because of the embeddings, I think, you know, because of the knowledge graph embeddings and representation learning, we don't necessarily need to build a matrix. We can directly operate on the knowledge graph. Conceptually, it is most like a matrix, I would say. Um, okay, so knowledge graph involves data cleaning. How to resolve this? as data cleaning is the most tedious task. I certainly won't argue with you over there. I think it is the most tedious task. So the entity resolution problem that, um, uh, you know, I covered a little bit in the slide uh, on the knowledge graph completion. I actually did my whole PhD thesis on that, on that one topic, which is the entity resolution. Um, you know, linking together nodes that refer to the same thing, right? So I certainly won't deny that it is very tedious, but I think that the, the thing that makes it easier now is that we have very good tools for it. So because we have good tools, we do not have to re-implement a lot of things. We can download the tool and now it becomes more of a question of uh, optimizing parameters. So I think that you try, you download the tool, you apply it, then you get some answers. Then you know you have to see where are you going wrong. And then you have to maybe tune some of the parameters, you apply it again and so on and so forth. So I wish that this were easy. Um, but it really isn't, you know, I, I, I think that you do have to, um, you can get 70% of the solution by using an off the shelf tool with data cleaning, with information extraction and so on. But the other 30% is where the secret sauce comes in. So I think the reason why Google and Facebook and so many companies have released open source packages is because they're very smart. They know that, okay, you can use the open source package. It's not going to give you the same level of quality that they have. If you want the same level of quality that they have, you have to use the package and then you have to do, a, do something extra. So you need to train something more. You need, you need to annotate more data. You need to do some extra stuff. And it's that extra stuff that is either patented or a trade secret. Usually it's a trade secret. It used to be patented a lot, you know, but these days a lot of it is trade secret. So the way that they do it, the way that they apply the special source is some combination of uh, data cleaning and data augmentation and usually it's not it's not that you need to be a genius to do this you just have to um somehow get the right pieces in place and it's a trial and error you know so i wish it were different i wish that this were easy to do but you're absolutely right that in any um task of this nature which involves um big data that is heterogeneous and noisy um you're going to run into this problem and knowledge graph is not an exception um 
but I think it does. What I like about it is that because you have a graph, even if you have noise, you do not need 100%. I would actually say that even if you have 60 to 70% accuracy, in, and there, you know, even if more than 20% of your knowledge graph is garbage, and even if the knowledge graph is incomplete, you can still do very good things with it. Um, you know, so that's, that's what I really like about it. So you do not need a perfect solution. Um, okay, so the problem with data extraction is privacy and companies do not disclose problems or data sets. How can knowledge graph help? I think even though companies will not disclose the proprietary data, you do have many data sets that are openly available at this point. So, um, you know, the wiki data, for example, you know, will give you a lot of general world knowledge about important political figures, artists, and important world figures, important places, important events, um, all of these things you can get from open source data now. So, and as a knowledge graph, so you don't even need to extract it. So that's one. Um, the second thing is, um, um, I think this brings up a broader question, which is that, uh, you know, the value of data. So we are now in an era where I think more than the software, I mean, the software is important, no question about it, but there are so many good open source packages that more than the software, I would say that the data has become very valuable. So that's why we don't know Uber's knowledge graph, for example, we don't know what's in that knowledge graph. I mean, there have been a few talks. So if you've attended those talks, you might know it, but for all we know, you know, th those talks happened a few months ago. So they may have changed everything since then, right? I mean, we, we don't know what's in their knowledge graph. Um, even the Amazon product graph, there have been a few talks on that. I know some of the key figures who work on that. Um, um, but, you know, uh, internally, it could be, it could still be very different. And, and they may not be releasing all the information. Certainly, Amazon is not going to give us their data, right? And the reviews and so on. I mean, we can't, we're not going to get, that's kind of their secret, uh, their, their uh, you know, value in a way. Right? I mean, we go to Amazon not because Amazon sells us the products, but because it enables um, other people to sell products. Right? And, uh, um, and they all go to Amazon and they have a very easy way of putting their data in and we have an easy way of finding the data. So Amazon is a marketplace. Right? So marketplaces do not release their data that easily. Search engines will not release their data that easily. So anyone who relies on data for a living, whether it's user data, product data, they are not going to give you their data because that is their value. That is where their, um, th that's where the, their valuation comes from. That's why they are valuable companies, right? So you might wonder, well, what can I do about it? Um, well, what you can do is that if you want to commercialize or you want to do something, you can start gathering your own data sets. And then, you know, maybe one day that might become your own proprietary, um, this thing. I know that there are companies, for example, um, you know, some of these open source companies like Dun and Bradstreet, um, not open source, but a company like Dan and Bradstreet, Bloomberg, um, many of Thomson Reuters, actually the biggest example would be Thomson Reuters. So Thomson Reuters, um, you know, has a lot of data products, right? It gives you access to intelligence on companies, on all kinds of things. It's not that it goes out and collects this data from companies. A lot of times, all of this data is openly available, but for somehow Thomson Reuters knows how to collect the data from all the different places combine them and give it to you in a way that it has very minimal noise so you can trust your data. And they have spent a lot of time and money doing this. And so that's why they are able to charge you for it because it's not that easy to build a product like that. So I think that that's where the secret sauce is. So how do you combine all the open source tools? That's one secret sauce. If you do come up with a truly revolutionary technology, then that you know, can, can be another secret sauce you know, and you can patent that. And the data sets that either you have internally that your users and clients generate or that you collect and combine into some data set that people are not able to get access to very easily um, would be another secret sauce. Okay, so last question and then I will paste the links. Um, are there repositories to handle ER and co-resolution? Um, also, does USC have open source tools and research papers? So for yeah, we do have some tools and research papers. So I think for entity resolution, one tool that we have developed is called RLTK. Um, and this, this is not the only one. There are several other tools, but you know, certainly this is one of them. It already has around 60 stars. I will just paste this in the chat. And um, you know, there's another tool called DIG or domain specific inside graph, which can allow you to construct an entire knowledge graph 
from Corpus. Now that tool, uh, we are um, currently making it production level. There is an open source version available, but we are trying to build a better version of that and release it. So do watch out for that. Um, the home page for that, by the way, is um, um, actually let me just give you my home web page. And into this, you know, you can, if you go to this web page, um, you know, you will see links to books and stuff. You will see um, there is a page on DIG. And uh, if you click on DIG, you will see the Dig ETL engine. There is a link for the Dig ETL engine. But this, this is, as I said, do not try this right now. I mean, if you're a good programmer, you should try this. But it is, you might encounter problems if you try it right now. We are making a production level available. So it will probably in a month or two, there will be a version of this that will be much easier to use. So I just want to point that out. If you're planning to use DIG, um, but DIG can actually help you to um, uh, build a knowledge graph completely from beginning to end, including doing all these things. A uh, co-reference resolution, NLTK is a very good package. NLTK and CC, I think both should have some co-reference modules. Um, um, let me actually see if I can um, point you to a link on NLTK. Um, I'll actually point you to a stack overflow. Um, I think that would be a, a, you know, you can read the messages there and it, it actually points you to some nice, um, this package, the Stanford core NLP is your best bet if you want to do the, which is the NLTK is also a kind of based on that um, in a way. But I think this is, you can actually do um, co-reference resolution in using, a, a, this is your best resource on Stack Overflow. And many of our papers, by the way, are on archive. So I think if you go to, again, my webpage, there is a full list of uh, publications on my webpage. And um, a lot of it is openly available. If, if something is not, then write to me and I can, um, I could maybe try to send it to you. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think the textbook, so the textbook that we are going to release towards the end of this year, um, even though it will cost some money, we are going to release an HTML. The textbook will also come with an HTML page. And the HTML page will actually be free. So if you want the PDF or if you want to buy the book itself, the physical book, you have to purchase the book. But if you, there is an HTML version that where you can actually get the whole book for free. It just won't be in one place. So you will have to go, you know, page by page, you know, so it's, it's, that would be a very nice free resource and it will contain software and resources for every chapter. So we will have chapters on IE on entity resolution and we will provide some uh, links and software to those. So, so hopefully, you know, um, I wish I could, I could give you many, many resources right now. I've given you a few, but um, the textbook would be a, one reason why we wrote the textbook is because there's no one stop, uh, 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 you know, availability of uh, publications, material, uh, resources, software, exercises. And so the textbook is meant to address that gap. Um, you know, so that, that, that is the, the one that I hope that you will look out for if you have a sustained interest in this. And with that, I, I can just very quickly maybe post three or four links, maybe take one last question, uh, if anyone has any, but um, just some links that I promised I would post. So, uh, um, so this is one, which is the COVID graph. Uh, um, I think for, for, for Spacey and Neo4j, you can search for them. Um, Star Space is over here. Um, and then uh, for the Google Knowledge Graph, I would recommend a YouTube video. Um, and yeah, you already have my home web page. Okay, so last question. Is there any application for KGs being used to mine data? I think um, they are very useful in information extraction. So, uh, you know, data mining is a broad field, right? So recommendations, all of these things fall under data mining to an extent, text classification and so on. But, um, you know, the, the place where I think knowledge graphs are really useful is that they can help you to extract data from new sources. So the COVID-19 paper that I pointed to earlier, um, you know, it's kind of an example of that, right? They are using something called weak supervision um, to extract concepts and entities from the COVID, from the Kaggle corpus, so 29,000, that one, it's the same as the Kaggle corpus. Um, 
But you know, what I really mean by this is that if you download Wikidata, um, you know, you can actually pre-train a knowledge graph embedding on Wikidata is even available. You can also train information extraction so that you are searching for things. Um, We're doing a search. We aren't just words. Sorry? So, you know, uh, I think um, it is playing the YouTube video. Sorry for the user Jonathan. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. So I, they are being used as um, because of the, um, I think because of the open source knowledge graph. So the geo names is very widely used for location extraction. Um, the GDELF database can help you to get events. Um, you know, you can mine data that way. Um, in fact, GDELT is kind of like a knowledge graph in itself. It's noisy, but it's, 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 if you go there, you will see that there is a, there's a page GDELT. You can search for that and you will see it. Um, and they, they have a very big data set that they uh, release openly. And, um, you know, and so they are, it's kind of, it, it's almost like a spreadsheet, but it's a knowledge graph actually. Um, so yeah, they are, they are being actively used um, is, is uh, what I will tell you. Uh, Okay, so I think this the last question is for Jason, which is that will you be providing this recording? Yeah, actually, you know, uh, if you go to uh, YouTube, we have a ideas channel to search, you know, International Data Engineering and Science Association on YouTube. Okay, we post all the, you know, uh, online webinar there. Uh, I think next week, you know, we can post today's, you know, recording to YouTube. We have a team to uh, prepare that. All right, wonderful. So I know we're running a little bit behind, but um, if anyone has other questions, uh, you know, please feel free to, to connect with me, to write to me on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm again very grateful to everyone for coming and, and listening and participating. And uh, I hope that uh, we will get to see uh, innovations uh, in knowledge graphs from you guys and that you will, you will use the knowledge graph going forward. I mean, I, I, we are always looking for more and more and more use cases. So, um, you know, hopefully you will, you will get good use cases and some ideas from this presentation. All right. Wonderful. All right. Have a good one. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you All for right. everyone. Okay. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.